think uh, we will start now. Uh, are we all set uh, at the division? Yes. Okay, good. So, um, welcome everyone to this uh, first presentation of, of the year of the Culture and Community Mental Health Speaker Series. Uh, the theme this year is the politics of psychic life. Um, this speaker series has two goals. One is to allow for a conversation that is at the intersection of anthropology as well as psychiatry. Um, and the, um, which has been a goal of the division of social and transcultural psychiatry since its very beginning. And the, uh, um, the other goal is really uh, to, to um, gesture at the co-influence of our individual mental life um, and the larger social and political context in which uh, we live. So the presentation will be recorded, but uh, if you uh, do not want your particular uh, comment in the uh, question period to be part of it, you can let us know and we'll make sure that uh, everyone who is part of the recording agrees with being there. So now um, I'm very honored to present uh, Professor Neely Myers. Uh, Neely Myers is um, an associate professor of anthropology at the Southern Methodist University. She is also an adjunct associated professor of psychiatry at the University of Texas, South, Texas South, Southwestern. Uh, she has published an excellent book in 2015, Recovery's Edge, that I had the chance to go through in large part. It is based uh, on her fieldwork in a recovery-oriented institution called the Horizon that is self-governed by individuals who went through my mental illness. So um, Professor Myers will tell us about this book, I believe, um, as well as, as of her recent work uh, that she's doing now. Her presentation today is called, as you can see, Pathways Through Care, Madness, Moral Agency, and Mental Health Recovery. So the floor is yours, uh, Professor Myers. All right, thank you so much, Vincent. Um, it's really lovely to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I'm a little nervous about doing this on Zoom. <laughs> so this is a first for me, um, except that I've been lecturing a lot. So hopefully this will go well. And um, I just wanted to start by saying that none of the photos in this presentation are of, of people are real. Um, they're all pulled from the internet. And um, some of the identifying details of people have been changed just to uh, so that they won't be recognizable or identifiable. All right, so without further ado, um, today I'm going to give a talk and I'm going to make three main points. So my first point is that mental breakdowns are also moral breakdowns and that they deplete moral agency. And I know that's a lot of uh, terms, so don't worry, I'm going to define them. Um, also, second, mental health services focus on treating mental breakdowns, but my data suggests that protecting and restoring moral agency is as important as pharmaceutical interventions. And my third point is that to better engage young persons in treatment, we need to address mental and moral breakdowns in a more balanced way. So to start off, I just want um, to ask you all to sort of keep something in mind as I'm going through the talk. So. Um, this is a quote from an author and he says, it's like everyone tells a story about themselves in their own head, always, all the time. That story makes you what you are. We build ourselves out of that story. And I just, I invite you to kind of think about what sort of story you have about yourself in your own head. And as I'm sharing the stories of uh, people that I engaged with in research, try to think about what kinds of stories are being told about them and what kinds of stories they want to tell about themselves. So my story actually begins uh, with my little brother. So all of my work is inspired by my experience with my family growing up. And this is a photo that was taken shortly before my youngest brother was diagnosed with um, childhood onset schizophrenia. So I have seen him going through the mental health system in the US my entire life. And um, that inspired me to want to take on an intellectual, intellectual project that blended both anthropology and clinical research to try and understand how social context shapes unusual mental events like the ones that my brother was experiencing. So my research looks at how social context shapes the experience of, uh, of mental health symptoms, how it shapes the understanding of mental health, um, how we understand what someone's going through, how we respond to that socially, um, how we try to treat it in, with 
our clinical systems of care and how this affects how people's sort of life trajectories and their outcomes. And just to give you a little context, um, when I'm talking about unusual event mental events, I'm actually studying ones that are sort of considered to be at the extreme end of the spectrum. So this is a painting um, from someone who was living in an asylum in Germany. It's in the Prinzhorn collection, which is a collection of outsider art um, at the University of Heidelberg. And this kind of displays how um, this particular person was having an experience where they thought that a radio operator was uh, shooting arrows of harm into their body and into their mind. And this was very disorienting and confusing for them. And it was something that other people couldn't really get on board with. Um, so when they tried to explain to others about this experience, other people weren't able to understand what that felt like. Um, those are considered to be Symptoms like that are considered to be positive symptoms of psychosis, like hallucinations and delusions. And then we have other symptoms called negative symptoms um, in the psychiatric parlance. And um, this is a depiction by an artist, John Hood, who wanted to show what it felt like to sort of try to experience these kinds of um, symptoms and how that feels in your emotion, how it makes you feel sort of emotionally flat, um, sometimes it's hard to express emotions. You may have issues with working memory or with attention. And um, so, so for some people, these kinds of experiences can be disabling. And for some people, they aren't very disabling. And so that's very puzzling. And this is something that I really wanted to research when I was younger because I was interested in trying to help my younger brother. So I decided to take a dual approach and I was attracted to anthropology because anthropologists study human adaptation and flourishing. And we like to develop theories about how humans go about adapting and flourishing um, in various settings around the world. So cross, cross culturally, um, different historical and social contexts. And then I also wanted to be a mental health services researcher because I wanted to apply what I learned from looking at how people adapt and try to flourish. And so that I could try and help shape some systems of care and, um, and move, move the field forward if I could with my work. So I was incredibly fortunate right at the beginning of uh, my research journey to meet people who themselves had not been disabled by experiences of um, extreme you know, extremely unusual mental events. And these people go by many different uh, titles. Some people say mad activists, some people say user survivors, some people say uh, people with lived experience. There are people who have, are more professionalized and they call themselves peer specialists. And I came across them early on and I learned so much from them about what it meant to sort of adapt and flourish and experience what they called recovery. Um, and for many of them, they'd been diagnosed with uh, some with schizophrenia and considered themselves to be in recovery from schizophrenia. So I wanted to understand how they ended up fine um, when so many people we know don't do as well. And I just wanna acknowledge that there are so many uh, identity politics around the terms that we use to talk about unusual mental events. And there's so many different ways that we can characterize people um, and how they want to be described themselves. And it's impossible to sort of honor all of those in one talk, but today I'm going to focus on using the term persons who've experienced a mental breakdown, because that is a term that I currently am finding um, to be comfortable both for the people that I'm engaging in research and with uh, the larger activist community that I interact with. So in my first book, um, in my, I'm, I'm writing a second book, I don't have a second book, but in my first book, Recovery's Edge, I was really looking at people who are long-term users of the American mental health care system. So they were people who had been in the mental health system for 10, 20, 30 years. They'd experienced homelessness and substance use um, issues and all, you know, incredible conditions of poverty and um, stressful living conditions that go, go along with um, being a person with psychiatric disabilities in the US. And what I was looking at was an effort to sort of ask them to recover. Um, and the way that they were being asked to recover was to become a rational and autonomous and hardworking, taxpaying, valued adult. And there were uh, a few different steps that went with this. And I describe all of this in my book, but I'm going to keep it brief here in the interest of time. Um, so they were expected to do this, to go through a journey of recovery and, and it sort of enter valued American adulthood, recover from their identity as uh, a long-term person with psychiatric disability. And I argue that this is based on this very American um, situation and very American context where you aren't born into a social position. 
um, you have to earn your regard. So there's this idea that you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and sort of become who you're supposed to be, that it's all up to you, it's your own destiny. And so I call this the American ethos of the self-made man. And I thought that the journey of recovery was really a reflection of that because we expected people all on their own to sort of self-actualize and become people who were hardworking, tax-paying adults. But what I found in my research was that actually what, what people really needed to learn and to know how to do is how to be able to act in a way that, that made possible intimate connections with other people, um, people who are willing to recognize them as a good person. And this had been seriously compromised by their long-term interactions with the mental health care system um, as it stood in the US. But moral agency, I argued, was a driver of mental health recovery. So what do I mean by moral agency? Well, I'm using the term moral because it's based on local moral worlds uh, or social contexts where people People have different ideas around the world and even in different communities, even in different um, subgroups of people who live together, who want to be together about what it means to be a good person. And so it's moral because it's based on a very local conception of, of what it means to be a good person. And the reason that it involves agency is that you can't just know what it means to be a good person. You have to be able to act like a good person. And, um, in, in acting like a good person, you're able to access intimate relationships with other people. So of course, I'm building on lots of other theorists here. I have some of them on the slide. And I argue that there's three key aspects of moral agency in the US. So there's autobiographical power or the ability to kind of be the editor of your own life story. There's the social basis of self-respect or getting others to recognize you um, and to feel recognized by others as the kind of person that you think you're that you think of yourself to be, like you speak your truth and other people honor that and acknowledge it and, and see you as that person that you believe yourself to be. Um, and the third is people at opportunities. So people willing to give you the ability to try and fail at this effort of becoming a good person. And when I was, uh, my daughter who's 13, she let me kind of give her a practice talk the other day. And she said, mom, this is, these are a lot of big terms, I'm lost. And so I thought about it a little more. <laughs> and uh, my daughter really loves theater. So if you think about it, autobiographical power is like trying to be the playwright of your own life or at least editing your own play. The social bases of self-respect are the audience that your, your play is going out to. Do they see you as the role that you're trying to embody? Um, do they understand what you're saying? Do they recognize you in that role that you're trying to take on? And then people and opportunities are the ability to practice, right? Because in the theater, we don't just get it right the first time. We have to practice. And sometimes we're going to have a bad performance or we're going to forget our lines. And that's something that we need people to let us do in order to become a better actor. So that's another way to think about moral agency. And when we're trying to become moral agents in the US, um, we're, what we're trying to do is have access to intimate relationships with other people because we're not just born into a situation where we uh, are told what career we're going to have usually or um, who we're going to marry. We don't have that arranged for us or what groups we're going to hang out with or where we're going to worship necessarily. So we have all this freedom around that, but that means that we have to get those groups to accept us for who we are, to to see us as we see ourselves. And so moral agency makes it possible to do things like get a job and find a life partner and belong in community groups. Um, and this is something that can be really limited for people with long-term psychiatric disabilities. And so I argue that having this ability to, to act, to make possible these relationships in a way by being seen as a good person is a key driver of recovery. And um, that a lot of the American mental health care system offers people this is sort of the reward for becoming uh, a rational, autonomous, hardworking, uh, tax-paying adult. But people really need the support early in the journey of recovery, of trying to become that kind of person in order to um, thrive and survive. And that's something in the book, I argue, um, that peer services actually seem to do really well. They're really willing to give people a chance and to be present for them intimately, to let them narrate their own lives and um, recognize them for who they feel themselves to be and give them opportunities to try and fail. Um, and that's why I think that's such a powerful way of providing care. So after all of this work, um, I became really interested in looking at what happened. So I've done all this work downstream with people who'd been you know, engaged in the mental health system for a long time, but I hadn't had a chance. Uh, but I was wondering, you know, at what point uh, do you need moral agency? How does moral agency look in the, in the beginning of uh, your interaction with mental health services? How does it look early on? 
And um, right around this time too, there was a big movement in mental health care. Um, earlier, the recovery movement had been big. All of a sudden we had this new movement, which is early intervention. Let's look, let's try and catch people early. Um, serious, uh, seriously unusual mental health events are can come in stages and if we catch people in an early stage then it's like a uh, cancer that can be stopped from spreading we can uh, help people get back to to life as usual and so early intervention services were developed and they actually seem to be doing pretty well and i'm sure this is a very very scarce review of the literature here um but early intervention services seem to prevent long-term negative outcomes like interpersonal violence, uh, suicide or hospitalizations. And it seems to be also good for governments, right? So we, we can see lots of evidence in the literature that they're cost saving. And so we see early psychosis programs springing up all over the US and, and in Canada and Australia and, and much of the world um, in an attempt to try and help young people and support them early so that they don't become long-term chronic um, users of mental health services. And one of the things that struck me as interesting about early intervention services early on is that um, I was doing some work with a colleague of mine, Michael Compton, who's just wonderful. He's a psychiatrist and he had um, some data and we were working on it. And it suggested that about 50% of young people using an early intervention service um, it, at a major hospital in a major US city weren't showing up for their follow-up appointments uh, after their initial hospitalization for psychosis. And then in the larger literature now, even you know, more recently, but there's been sort of reviews, synthesis of the research. It shows that about a third of young people don't follow up, uh, don't attend any follow-up appointments, even when there's really nice specialty services available that are supposed to be geared towards young people. And so I designed a study with Michael and we actually designed it for DC, for Washington DC, but then I, I received a tenure track job at SMU. And so I moved the study to Dallas and um, the study was ethnographic by nature because I'm an anthropologist. So it, it meant long-term in-depth uh, field work and interviews with young people and their key supporters around how they made decisions about treatment after their initial hospitalization for psychosis. So I found a great set of colleagues in, um, in Dallas who are willing to work with me and let me work in their hospitals, in particular one hospital that allowed me to work in, their, in a psychiatric emergency room. So the whole facility, was dedicated to psychiatric emergencies. There were no people with heart attacks or strokes or anything like that. It was all psychiatric emergencies. They saw about 23,000 patients a year. And on average, they had about two patients with early psychosis a week um, that were possible to recruit. So I decided that would be a great spot. And um, I started working there with a, a small research team. And we based, what we did is we met people in the hospital and we um, did it, our initial interviews and consent process there. And then for about a six month period, we followed up with them up to four times with home visits and we did open ended person centered interviews um, with the young person and their key supporter. And um, the reason we chose to look at key supporters was because we didn't want to just or interview family in case that's not who the young person saw as someone who was supporting them in their recovery um, or in their life goals. So we gave people sort of an open platform to decide who their key supporter was. And we were interested in looking at engagement and decision making. So what matters to young people and their key supporters most at this time during these early months, because we know that engaging people early in early intervention services can um, have a good result. So our sample, um, so in the end, we were able to recruit about 48 young people uh, across about two and a half years. And um, they were about 22 years old. So I put 23 here because it was literally 22 to 20. 2.9 was kind of the range. So they were in their 22nd year. And most of them, um, about half of them were middle to upper middle class. Um, for those that we had data for that on, we had 16 that we weren't really able to assess their, their class. We used the Holland's Head Index, which had several indicators and we didn't have all the indicators for everybody. Um, but they were a diverse group. So there were about 73% racial and ethnic minorities, um, about 40% Latinx, 30% black, 16% white. And then about half of them were immigrants. We had um, about a quarter first generation and a quarter second generation. And we had 19 key supporters. Out of those, about two thirds were women. Um, about two thirds were my racial and ethnic minorities and uh, about two thirds were a parent. So a lot of moms, even though we were trying to not <laughs> necessarily isolate our study to moms. 
Um, so the research team was myself. Um, I had a wonderful postdoctoral fellow, Anuba Sood, and also several SMU students that I have. Um, I'm so grateful for both graduate students and undergraduate students were involved in this project, both in data collection and data analysis. Um, so we ended up with 141 one to two hour interviews over, over time. We made over 75 home and community visits. So by community, it was usually a Starbucks if people weren't comfortable meeting at their house. And this resulted in about 5,000 pages of interview data and field notes, which is a really staggering amount of data. I crashed my computer when I opened the file. So, <laughs> um, so I uploaded it all into a, a data analysis software called Deduce, which um, offers a mixed method flexibility. So we were able to use that to sort through some demographics and things like that as well. Um, and because I'm an ethnographer, I have to say that there is a very specific local context of care here in Dallas. Um, at the time we were doing research, several of uh, the people, several of the facilities that young people were crossing through on their way to our psychiatric emergency room were under investigation for various human rights violations, um, patient deaths, and things like that. So it was pretty messy at the time in terms of um, the quality of care that was on offer to people in crisis. And um, in addition, we, we did have an early intervention service that was in its very nascent stages, um, but it only the it had, we contracted with the state in such a way that we were only able to offer services to the most indigent population so they had to be living well below the poverty level receiving public health insurance and that was really unusual in fact out of the the 48 young people in the study only two actually qualified for the early psychosis service so most of the young people were not we could not refer um to, to any kind of uh early intervention treatment even though even though we were trying to let them know about it and um, I'll, I mean, this is kind of part and parcel of what's going on in Texas, where we're 48th, we're out of 50 states, we're the 48th um, in terms of mental health funding. So it's, it's, you know, a huge problem across the state. And perhaps this is why we saw, one of the things that we noticed early on was that we saw a lot of what we decided to call bouncing in our data. So young people, A10 is one of the young people, were getting shifted all over the place um, in this kind of carousel of care. And this was in the first three months. So this person was bounced between 12 different institutions um, during the first three months. So this is a really chaotic mental health care system. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I know you, I think you might have a better setup in Canada. <laughs> so our diverse group of young people, um, because they were diverse, I also just want to draw attention to some, inter some issues of intersectionality that can affect uh, these groups. So we know that race and ethnicity shapes the experience of psychosis. Um, there's a lot of data suggesting that in the U.S. and uh, particularly in the coming out of the U.K. that uh, people uh, who are of color are more likely to receive a, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, which is really considered to be the worst case scenario diagnosis, um, that they have more negative and complex pathways to care. There's more um, police intervention, you know, arrest, violence, things like that, and that they're more likely to be over medicated when they do get care. Um, and then second generation migrants we know are more prone to developing psychosis in the first place. Um, and so there's, some, there's a link as well between, you know, half of our young people were, were immigrants, about 25% second generation. So um, there's something to be thought about there as well. And then as I've been thinking through the data, I've also been thinking a lot about the developmental context. And um, so psychosis happens to young people when they're at a really vulnerable age. They're trying to transition to adulthood. They're trying to pr prove themselves in the world. And they have this incredibly disruptive set of experiences um, that are very disorienting to them. And I think that's sort of under considered in some of the literature. Um, they're trying to literally accumulate moral agency right now because they, they need a broader set of people to see them as a good person and to open the door for more intimate relationships and things like employment and roommates and intimate partnerships. And um, this is all in question anyway because they're transitioning to adulthood. Um, and then psychosis really puts an extra challenge there for young people. Um, indeed, uh, the, the psychoanalyst and sort of expert on adolescence, Eric Erickson once said, for indeed in the social jungle of human existence, there is no feeling of being li alive without a sense of identity. So we're all looking for our sense of identity, especially at this tender time. So at first we thought we would sort people by whether or not they engaged or disengaged. And then we found that that was really messy um, and was really hard to do. And um, the more we tracked, the more complicated it got. And it became really difficult to think about anyone as engaged in this particular system of care. 
um, and what disengaged was wasn't clear. Um, were people engaged if they were in the hospital the whole time? They did attend their first three follow-up appointments, which was our uh, criteria, but did that count? Um, what if the parents were really engaged and were kind of dragging uh, the young person to appointments, but the young person didn't want to be there and was not taking their medication? Or what if um, the young person really wanted to go, but their parents wouldn't take, wouldn't drive them there? They have no public transportation. They're not supposed to drive hospital orders. So it was really confusing to figure out who was engaged and who was not. And then in addition, we did, we only had one interview with 18 of the young people. So out of the 48, 18 of them, we had one interview with. We did have multiple interviews with several of them, but we decided that for about 18 of them, we had an, we had a complete set of data across three or four months that suggested whether or not they were using services or not using services and whether or not that was their choice. And we decided to, instead of call them engaged or disengaged, just to call them users or refusers um, because it really became unclear what engagement would even be. And they were pretty demographically similar um, in terms of users versus refusers. In addition, they were pretty demographically similar to the overall group of 48. Um, so we still had, you know, 40 to 60 percent middle, upper middle class, um, 40 to 60 percent um, immigrant and things like that. So all of those demographics kind of held across the two groups. Um, and we found that users and refusers had a lot in common. Um, and we wrote this, so we actually wrote up an article that's in Psychiatric Services that you're welcome to look up. Um, and it sort of summarizes in, in a very quantitative way, um, a, quant, a quant call way, uh, the data. And in it, we look at these, the, the factors, the, num the top factors for why people decided to use um, treatment or drop out of treatment. And the number one factor across all the participants, which included young adults and their key supporters, was that they wanted to get back to normal. Um, so that was number one. And the second was that the care on offer was not enough. So they really felt like they needed more resources than they were getting. Um, the third overall was police involvement. A lot of people were really distressed by police involvement in uh, their pathway to care. 70% of them talked about this. Um, it's, I think it's important to notice that for just the young adults um, in the study, that the second top concern after getting back to normal was actually paying for care. There was a lot of concern about how they were going to pay for care. One young person said, I might as well have gone to college for a year uh, based on the medical bill that I just got. So there's a lot of concern about that um, early on. And even though there were payment options and things like that, that that would come up later for some of our young people who's, who we stayed engaged with in the study, um, at this early time, it was really demoralizing not to, to have this huge hospital bill. Um, and they also felt disempowered. And specifically, they felt disempowered by what they considered to be a traumatic hospitalization um, and early treatment experience. And so because I'm an anthropologist, I saw these, these patterns in the data based on our coding um, and our qualitative analysis, and I wanted to dig deeper into the data. Um, and so I decided to go ahead and do that. And so this brings me to the first point I want to make as I, as I uh, dug deeper into the data, which is that a mental breakdown is a moral breakdown and that it depletes moral agency. So um, for long-term users of the mental health system that I studied in my first book, they didn't have a lot of moral agency already um, and because of their sort of long-term engagement with the system and the kinds of lifestyle they were living um, under that system. But for young people, I could see right away that they were starting to lose their sense of moral agency right at the beginning. And um, this is because psychosis is really a, a moral breakdown. So when I started hearing more and more about these stories of what young people went through early on, I realized that um, in order to, so no one wants to take their kid to the psychiatric hospital or to call the police on them. And so there really has to be a very serious breakdown between your sense of reality and your loved one's sense of reality for someone to do that. Um, Jarrett Zygon talks about this in a, in a different context and he calls it a moral breakdown. So he describes it as a mutual incomprehensibility between a person and their loved ones. And I definitely saw this going on. Um, easy translation of that, when even your mother who really wants to understand you can't understand what you're talking about. Um, and when you're taken for granted ideas about the world and, and its ethical shape, what is good, beautiful, and true are suddenly not there. So as an example, I want to talk briefly about Amy. Um, so Amy, uh, you know, had been through a lot of different things. She was, ha she was having trouble transitioning to adulthood anyway. The, um, the financial crisis in, in 2007 had interrupted her 
career. She'd had trouble getting back on her feet. She'd been living with um, her sister and brother-in-law and their two daughters in a city that wasn't Dallas. And she just became increasingly agitated and confused. And she started accusing her sister and her husband of being child molesters, which was really upsetting um, to the sister and her husband. Nobody around them could orient themselves to Amy's worldview in this case. Um, all the family was very confused. It was very disruptive. She was, um, she became more and more agitated about it, started talking, speaking about it publicly, calling the police, um, just really upsetting behaviors for her family of whom, who could not believe that this was true, did not seem, it did not seem to be true. Um, and so Amy was having a moral breakdown. Her family could not, they are having a mutual incomprehensibility between what was real and what was not. So in, after months of this, um, the sister in desperation sent Amy to a homeless shelter to try and transition her into some kind of different housing. They realized they couldn't have her at home anymore. And Amy um, ended up getting sent to the psychiatric hospital. So when she got out of the psychiatric hospital, she a, a few days later, she was sent back to the shelter and she called a different sister who lived in Dallas. And that sister agreed to have her come and stay with her for a little while while they were trying to figure out what on earth was going on with Amy, who wasn't making any sense. Um, so Amy took the bus up to Dallas and when she got off, she was feeling really disoriented. Um, the moral breakdown that she was experiencing was really exacerbating her mental distress. She was very confused. She'd been through a lot. She'd been hospitalized and let out. She'd been through some homeless shelters. This is not who Amy imagined herself to be. This is not the story that she wanted her life to be about. Um, and as she's walking around and she's walking over a bridge and she thinks that it seems like she could maybe, um, fly. And she thinks about trying to see if that's real. Um, and, and then she realizes that that's not probably the best idea. And some part of her knows that she probably needs help. And she sees some police officers standing nearby. And so she asks them for help. And she starts explaining how she's feeling. And they decide to take her um, into the psychiatric hospital. So Amy is taken into the psychiatric hospital. And that's where things start to get to really go not in the direction Amy was hoping they would go in. Um, so the police intervene and um, sitting in this hospital, I could sort of see the rooms where people were first brought in and their interactions with the police in those rooms. Um, I did see a lot of struggle, a lot of people getting upset, getting um, strapped down to, to beds or handcuffed to beds um, until they were able to get an injection and um, they actually called it a cocktail of drugs, Ativan and um, Benadryl, which are sedatives, and, and people fell asleep then for about 24 hours in a recliner, and then they were, then they did intake after that um, with, with more of the cocktail. Um, so Amy was taken through the situation, and she found it to be really upsetting. Um, later on, she says, okay, so they took me to the hospital, and of course, they admitted me. I was going crazy, and the first night they admitted me, they had a camera where they had to take a picture. And I guess it just set me off and I tried to smash it and they had to put me in four point restraints. Um, Amy's, one of Amy's sisters told me later that she, she's very much, uh, very image conscious. And so um, she really, this idea of being on camera and having her picture taken was very upsetting to her. It kind of set her off and she felt like it was pretty humiliating, very disempowering. So we can see how this experience of moral breakdown in Amy's story has depleted her sense of moral agency. She's, she's losing her autobiographical power. She's finding herself in, a, in scenes of a play that she didn't write, that she doesn't want to be in. She's losing her social basis of self-respect. She's not the kind of person who has photographs taken of her when she's uh, losing her mind. She's not the kind of person who gets strapped down to a bed in four-point restraints. And she's really worried that her peopled opportunities are going to become limited now. She's not sure who's going to let her back into their lives who's going to let her try again to be a good person. It's causing her a lot of anxiety and her moral agency is dropping. I'm seeing this in all everyone else's stories too, so many stories. Um, Mariana became very confused uh, over time at home. She thought that someone was trying to get in touch with her that she'd been dating in the past and um, became convinced that they were hiding in her, her home. And so there was a lot of destruction to the house as she was trying to find this person and people were getting in her way. And, there was a violent altercation and she was taken in um, for the first time to the hospital. And she says that this isn't how she wanted it to go. Um, she knew she was at the breaking point where she needed help, but she would have liked to have had therapy versus being taken to this emergency space by the police. 
Um, another young man, Edgar, who's about 19, he's talking about um, sort of how disempowering the hospital is and, and about how you can't even go to the bathroom without someone swiping a card. It's too much. It just destroys you. I think it just makes you mentally disturbed. So they're telling me again and again how this experience of mental breakdown was breaking down their sense of, of, of moral agency. Here, Edgar's talking about how his self-respect for himself is, you know, compromised when he can't even decide when he can go to the bathroom. Um, and then families are also struggling with this and they're struggling with how, you know, how are we going to give this person another chance when they come out? How are we even going to communicate with them? We don't have the resources that we need in order to do this well. And so this is um, Mariana's mom. She says, we didn't know how to communicate with her when she was psychotic. Again, this moral breakdown, this incomprehensibility. I was scared I'd say the wrong thing. And again, it was like we were all walking on eggshells and they didn't have any help when the young people came home to try and figure out how to repair that breach and overcome that, that breakdown. So we have this vulnerable group who's because, if not because they're racial and ethnic minorities to begin with, they're also um, at this incredibly vulnerable age, which is transitioning to adulthood, their identity is precarious. Um, we have a really challenging situation where their loved ones can't understand what's going on and they're going through these very toxic experiences with early care that are depleting their moral agency. So of course, um, that brings me to my second point, which is that protecting and preserving moral agency becomes an incredibly huge uh, focus for them in the next few months. They're, they're very committed to trying and, and rebuilding their sense in themselves and others that they're a good person. And this is at least as important as pharmaceutical interventions. I'm going to argue. And part of the reason why it's so important is because it was really um, at the root of why people were, were refusing and using care. So young people who saw care as a way to restore their moral agency were using it. And young people who saw care as a way, uh, as, as detrimental or um, not a way to restore their moral agency were refusing it. So I'm gonna start with um, the refuser stories. So the refusers are actively seeking to preserve or restore their moral agency. And so again, they're trying to sort of become the playwrights of their own lives um, to convince their audience that they are, that they deserve the role that they've given themselves, that they can respect themselves in this role, that they're respectable. And they need the opportunity to try and fail at that role because God knows I didn't become an adult overnight, right? <laughs> we, need, we need chances to, uh, to practice and, and get it right. So um, Dawn, is an example of someone who refused care in order to try and get it right. So she wants to be the playwright of her own life. Dawn points out that she's feeling wonderful without her medication, that it's a sunny day at sunset, and that she's not going to take uh, any more prescriptions, refills, no thank you. Um, she says, me as a person, I don't like being on drugs. I don't like taking pills, medicine. Growing up in my childhood, I never had to go into the hospital. So now being, showing up and going to these appointments and stuff, I don't like it. That's just from a person that don't hardly go around clinics and stuff. So Dawn was not wanting to become a patient. That was not something that was in her life story and she didn't want it there. Andre was struggling with um, side effects and the social basis of self-respect for Andre and, and his community that, was, that mattered to him was this ability to, be, uh, to embody a way of being masculine. And this way of being masculine was to be able to have a functioning, um, functioning male organs. And so he says that he would rather um, be put on an island with a bunch of people who aren't, who are uh, experiencing mental illness, just put on an island to live out the rest of my life, life like that, rather than um, having this uh, sexual dysfunction that he's experiencing with the drugs. So he decides to refuse treatment um, even though he's not feeling well because he does not want to experience that, uh, that challenge to his masculinity that's so important to him. Another young man, Elijah, um, he, he was in school and uh, he lost his ability to go to school because of um, some incidents that happened when he was experiencing psychosis. And so he uh, was not able to go back to school and he had to go back home and back home he really really needed people to give him another chance and to try and fail in his community and in his community that local moral world was all about praying and not taking medication so they didn't they believed that if you had strong enough faith that you would overcome whatever was challenging you and so elijah did not engage in care he refused treatment because 
um, the stigma of mental illness of having treatment was too high and his community was willing to receive him in whatever condition he was in as long as he was uh, faithful and thought that he could, could conquer this with prayer. Um, another person who I actually wrote about in uh, an article that I published in Ethos, but um, Ariana, she's also working on moral agency. And I want to tell her story briefly, just so you can see how early people are working on this. So it seems like right away they're aware that um, they need to repair their ability to edit their own lives, to, to be able to be seen as a good person. Um, when I met Ariana in the emergency room, um, she'd been waiting there about 48 hours in a chair and she hadn't slept. Uh, the nurses were like, good luck with that one. Um, but I went and sat down with her and she was very distressed. She was very uncomfortable in her body. Um, she was breathing heavily. She was breathing heavily on me. And that was disorienting for me. Um, I was having trouble orienting myself to her. She was convinced that um, there was an infectious disease going around called Ebola. Indeed, we had had Ebola in Dallas not long before. Um, and that Ebola, however, unlike Ebola, was spread through bad breath and through our lungs. And as she's saying that she's breathing on me, which is making me feel really uneasy. Um, but at the same time, she's trying to orient me into her, into her space. And she's trying to convince me that she's a good person. So she tells me um, that she's she's given blood three times that she's also been a volunteer like I am and that she did pretty well in high school. And, and so maybe I share her ethic of um, being, you know, a good student. So she's trying to, ex to situate herself as the kind of person that I might see as a good person. So she's aware that she's had a moral breakdown that, that her shared sense of reality um, has, has broken down between her and other people that they're having trouble seeing her as a good person. They've put her in the psychiatric hospital her mother and people from her church, and she's trying to reorient herself. Um, Zygon and Throop have written that narrative interactions and moments of moral breakdown are not only important as meaning-making activities for mutual understanding, but are essential to the process of coming together to be coming to be in the world together again. And I'm arguing that Ariana was very much aware of this. In fact, she says, people think I'm crazy. And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, I think I'm a good girl trying to save the world. It's not very easy to do. Um, this is the role that Ariana wanted to have at this moment. This is her autobiographical power. She's scared and she's vulnerable and she needs her audience, which is me, to go along and let her try and fail again. Um, so she's looking for these people at opportunities. Luckily for Ariana, when she gets out, her family is willing to give her a chance to try and fail and try again. So over the next few months, um, she ends up leaving her job and taking up a role as a caregiver for um, her brother's kids. And um, she said she's visiting him in another state and he's like, Ariana, so you went to the crazy house and now you're taking in my child. How does it feel? I'm like, you know what? It feels like I'm not crazy. And he says, and I say, right. And she says, but we're just joking about it. It was joke after joke. So she finds this way to sort of experimentally reorient herself um, as a good person in the world with the help of her family. So I just wanna say in case I sound naive here that refusing treatment did not work for everyone, that I'm not saying that refusing treatment is the way to, you know, to the, is the, the golden road. Um, some people did need mental health treatment. Some of the refusers had really devastating outcomes. Um, and, and, you know, Ariana was lucky. She had everything in place. People were willing to give her moral, her moral agency and she, she thrived um, even without treatment. But, but this effort to refuse um, did help protect and replenish moral agency for, some, for the young people. And we need to honor that um, in our services and, and what we offer people. So users also used um, services when they saw that it was a route to restore their moral agency. So here we can see um, how Calista feels like she's going to take back control of her own life um, when she gets a paycheck from the government that's going to help her with her daughter as a result of her having um, experienced a, a mental breakdown. Um, she argues that this is okay in her family, that her aunt has also received um, a disability check, and that in her world it's okay uh, for this to be this way because um, she comes from a world of incredible poverty. And so um, being able to contribute to the family income in any way is helpful. So she's writing her story as a person who's uh, pulling their weight, getting a paycheck, um, taking their medication, and following along with the prescribed treatment so that she can make this contribution to her family. This gives her the social basis of self-respect. And I have to say that across a lot of the stories, um, people who were involved in families 
where someone had had a history of mental illness um, had grown up hearing, oh, if that person only used their treatment, then th they wouldn't be this problem. There wouldn't be all these problems. They would be okay. They wouldn't be living this way. And so young people who'd heard, who grew up hearing those stories a lot were much more likely to see um, mental health services as a tool for getting better because they didn't, they'd seen what happened to their aunt when she didn't use mental health services and they didn't want that to happen to them. So it became a way of, they could see that um, securing social, social respect was going to be important. It would be important likely to use services. Um, also, we have a, um, another reason that people use services was because it was linked to their ability to try and fail, right? To be supported by their families. So if it was linked to housing, it was very often linked to housing, then they would um, use services early on because of the housing. And then the, the more they use services, the more comfortable they got with it and they would um, stay in the services. So that, that brings me to my third point, which is that to better engage young persons in treatment, we need to address mental and moral breakdowns in a more balanced way because both are crucial for recovery. And I think it's interesting um, to think about this, whether or not we need to you know, have a point where we reach a moral breakdown. Um, Eric Erickson talks about how young people um, bewildered by the incapacity to assume a role forced on them by the inexorable standardization of American adolescence run away in one form or another, dropping out of school, leaving jobs, staying out all night, or withdrawing into bizarre and inaccessible moods. Once delinquent, their greatest need and often their only salvation is the refusal on the part of older friends, advisors, and judiciary personnel to type him further by pat diagnoses and social judgments, which ignore the special dynamic conditions of adolescence. Seeming psychotic and criminal incidents do not have the same fatal significance they have at other ages. And I would argue that if we try to help people very gently in this early stage to sort of get back to their everyday lives in a, in a smooth way, whether that be with or without um, mental health services, that that could probably be the ideal because these could be um, brief incidents in one's life instead of a defining moment. But mad activists um, like Sasha de Brule, who himself has experienced psychosis and has written a great book that I use to think through some of my data, he writes that our culture's version of guidance is to diagnose someone as mentally ill stick them on antipsychotic meds and lock them up in the hospital. There are so many kids being locked up and given drugs because they don't fit the narrow rules that the system lays out for them. Um, so we have this, we have young people who are sort of having these experiences and they're getting pathologized. And I love um, the way that this, uh, I love this quote, if we don't learn to mythologize our lives, inevitably we will pathologize them. So we're all going to make mistakes, bad things are going to happen, we're all going to get confused and disoriented, especially in the transition to adulthood. If we don't learn how to incorporate that into our story, um, they might get pathologized. And I, I think it's just a really tender time we can think more carefully about that. I think one set of people who's thinking really carefully about that and offers a good alternative or a set of supports um, are people who are working on mutual support for um, young people with early psychosis. And I, I could add so much more to this slide and I'm happy to share information. Um, but there are people who are, have created mutual support networks. In some cases, but not all, they're working outside of the traditional system of care to support each other. So um, we have the Mad Pride Movement, which um, has had parades in, in Canada um, and other parts of the US. We have mutual support collectives like the Hive in Vermont. Um, where people are just gathering together and, and sharing strategies and stories and they're in person. And then there are also resources online um, like the Icarus Project, which actually Sasha de Brule himself co-founded with a friend. Um, in the Icarus Project, they're, in their original mission statement, they said that defining ourselves outside convention, we see our condition as a dangerous gift to be cultivated and taken care of rather than a disease or disorder needing to be cured. So, de Brule was able to sort of harness some autobiographical power. Um, he admits that this is likely because, you know, he was a white male and had privilege, um, but he was able to do that. And in doing so, he was able to cultivate a sense of moral agency that helped him move forward and, and stay in recovery. Um, and in case you're thinking that, you know, based on the last slide, there's this harm reduction guide to coming off psychiatric drugs. Not all activists or mutual support communities are anti-psychiatry or, or again, you know, are insisting on harm reduction, um, are, are insisting, <laughs> they're probably all insisting on harm reduction, are insisting on not using psychiatric drugs. In fact, Rule himself um, writes that he needed to take drugs to control his superpowers, um, that he tried having a narrative and putting himself in a role where he was a superhero and 
came off psychiatric drugs that in a way that inspired his community to do the same. Um, but he realized that that, uh, he says that I burned spectacularly with the fire of visionary madness and that it all came crashing down. And so um, he acknowledges that for some people, and a lot of this community does acknowledge that for some people, medication is going to be just as important um, as, as moral agency. But in the end, having people around you to support you is incredibly important. Um, as the rule says, most of us had never had mentors and guides to lead us through to the other side and teach us how to be superheroes. And I think that's, so true in our in American culture anyway, we have very few elders or guides. We don't have rites of passage. We don't have ways for young people to transition to adulthood that are particularly supported. A lot of people aren't even involved um, in the church anymore or in other structures that used to be in place to help young people and advise them that are outside of mental health care. So I think we need more opportunities like that. So conclusions, um, I, I hope I made my three main points, which are, are that mental breakdowns are also moral breakdowns, that mental health treatment as usual focuses on mental breakdowns, but my data suggests that preservation and restoration of moral agency is, an important, is as important um, as pharmaceutical in intervention. And that to better engage people in treatment, we need to address mental and moral breakdowns in a more balanced way. So I really like this um, quote by Luke Kiernan, who himself has experienced psychosis and, and now works in, uh, at least volunteers, in an early psychosis intervention service in Canada. And he says, uh, to view these experiences like psychosis as endpoints, as brief silences or as something discreet and outside of their larger context is dangerous, both ethically and academically. They have sonic reverberations, consequence, and as the night can fall fast, we should be astute and boundless in mobilizing agency and becoming, of injecting compassion into that lifeblood to assuage the burden of self, of taking responsibility, of listening. And I think that Karen's really pointing to the importance of um, mutual support here. So to improve engagement, um, we should take seriously the, the finding from my study that, you know, 100% of young people and their key supporters wanted to get back to normal. And we might help young people understand that they might even get to get back to something that's better than uh, their former normal. And we can do this by asking what is their story and including mutual support and meaning making and mythologizing in the healing process, um, giving people opportunities to do that. We, we can work on reversing pathologizing rituals that harm a person's sense of moral agency, like using the police as a frontline provider of, of mental health intervention, like using restraints, like unnecessary hospitalizations, uh, assigning people really extreme diagnoses when they're so early in the course of their illness, we don't really know what what, it, what their diagnosis should be. Um, and also not over medicating people. A lot of young people are given too much medication, which can cause sexual side effects, like the kind that really bothered um, Andre. What matters to people? Um, and we also need to ask something that I think is very under asked, which is what matters to the people that matter to the people that we're trying to serve? How, can, um, how, how do those people expect them to become a good person? Um, how do the people they love want to, to see them turn out in the world? And, so many, I, I know that uh, in Canada, you probably have all these great supports, but uh, where, I, where I'm living, there's not a lot of family therapy. There's not vocational support. There's not efforts to keep people engaged with their family, engaged with school, engaged with higher education, which is also important to thriving and to transitioning to adulthood successfully. Um, and it may be that people want to engage in moral support more than medical support, and that also needs to be okay. Engagement um, in you know, mental health services isn't necessarily the goal, um, just engaging in general in some way with some, some forms of support that are meaningful to someone. So there are all these possible tools um, that have emerged like um, arts-based therapies, arts-based sharing on social media platforms, um, uh, having, I mean, in, in the pre-COVID days, having um, film screenings or sharing of uh, digital stories, art shows, things like that, places where people can express themselves um, expressionally, which is something Edgar was talking about earlier in a quote. Um, a peer crisis support and respite centers so that young people aren't arrested by the police and sent to um, emergency rooms and they can bypass that whole traumatic experience of care. I know that's being attempted in many places. Um, using faith-based support, educating uh, churches and other faith communities about what it means to, to have a mental health crisis and how they can support someone. Um, supporting people in higher education environments, training colleges about what, I can't believe uh, how difficult it is for colleges and universities to respond 
well to young people in crisis. And I think a lot more thought could be put into that um, to help people stay in school and, and support them in that effort. Um, a lot of the families that I worked with really were hoping that um, my home visits would be followed up by uh, healthcare home visits. And so people loved having someone come into their home and to see kind of how they're living, what they're doing, and they felt like that was very therapeutic for them. So I think um, something like that would be great. Uh, using hearing voices groups, other mutual support groups that are not pathologizing, that aren't necessarily linked to medicine. And then I think for, for people who are really struggling um, financially, having basic income grants that kind of gives them a reprieve from work, but certainly at least, and I think you might have this in Canada, but in the US, a lot of, a lot of people do not have insurance for mental health care. And these staggering costs are keeping people from engaging. We should have universal mental health care, um, especially for young people who've had a, a serious crisis. So I just want to say that um, I learned so much from engaging with all of these wonderful people in my study. And I learned uh, especially that having your own story and having it be meaningful to you is kind of what makes life worth living in so many ways. Um, so I just wanted to encourage you all to not be satisfied with the stories that have come before you, but to also work on unfolding your own myth because we can all learn from what I learned from in this work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meyer. Uh, um, I suggest perhaps that we, um, uh, that we uh, when the PowerPoint is uh, over, that we close it so we can see all of yeah. each other. <laughs> and, uh, you're all welcome to open your camera if, you, if you'd like so that we can uh, become a little forum here. Um, and um, I would um, ask if the, someone has a, a question that uh, this person is welcome. And perhaps I will, uh, I will uh, open the, the, the question period. So I was wondering, um, in your work at the early uh, psychosis clinic, how did the diagnosis itself uh, could lead to uh, could lead or hinder the uh, uh, moral agency process. So I guess that when you receive a diagnosis of psychosis, then the kind of uh, action that you can take, which are good or bad, for example, taking medication or uh, all this is kind of curtailed. But so I can see it can have good side and perhaps also negative side. So I, I wonder what you have observed about this. Well, I, I think the you know the word psychosis um, a lot of so a lot of people don't even know what that means um, or their families and the first thing they do is they go on YouTube or they go online and they look it up and then it's really upsetting what they come across the information um, they immediately are seeing news stories about it. and a lot of people would equate that immediately with news stories local news things that had happened. Um, we had a young man who very tragically uh, murdered people with a machete when I was doing this field work. And he was very, um, you know, so many, so many things went into that. It wasn't just that he was experiencing psychosis, you know, but that's, that stands out to people a lot in, in news stories. And so when they first hear psychosis, they're not hearing this like subtle nuanced um, peer led mutual support kind of messaging of, you know, okay, everyone has, a lot of people have had these experiences. Lots of people hear voices or have visions. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily um, going to have a lifelong illness or that you're going to kill your mother. Um, these are all incredible sources of anxiety. It's very anxiety producing. And so I don't really understand why we need to give people this diagnostic label, especially when it's so early on. Um, and they could be just a, a, one, a single time occurrence. Um, it could be something that they move on from very quickly and easily. But when they get stuck in this rut of thinking of themselves as someone who has this terrible illness, a lot of people also interestingly equated it with um, uh, developmental disability. So there's really a, limit, a limited mental health literacy, I think, in the general population. Some people's parents thought that they, you know, they would, they would say, oh, my, you know, my parents think I'm, are gonna think I'm stupid now, or um, that, I, that I can't think for myself, or there's just all these, very stigmatizing, very bad information kind of things going on around the diagnosis. Interesting. So I hear that the uh, popular media representation of uh, mental illness does play a role in the people's experience. Absolutely. And just, I mean, the you know, I, we could try it now. Google psychosis. <laughs> See what happens, right? It's not, 
And a lot of kids went on YouTube to look. And so they would see like weird videos of, yeah, it was not well curated information they were having access to. And I just want to make sure you know that this wasn't an early psychosis service, right? This is an emergency setting. People aren't in the US automatically referred to an early psychosis program. We didn't have one here. Um, for 46 of the 48 people we talked to couldn't even qualify for it. Um, and so they were pretty much sent out with a prescription and a follow-up appointment with a psychiatrist. Okay, thank you for this clarification. So now um, um, anyone that would like to ask a question, just open the mic and and please uh, Maybe I'll jump in with a sort of ramble, maybe not a question, but hopefully um, related. I'm, I think the concept of moral agency is really useful here. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and in thinking you know, about all these points you made and your suggestions at the end of how one could regain that moral agency once it's been lost, I just, I'm struck by how profoundly relational that process is, that it really doesn't seem like the kind of thing one can do on their own. Like there's a certain amount of work you can do to rewrite your own story, but really you do that in relation with others. And I think for a lot of people who've just experienced a crisis like that, the people that they see regularly are clinicians and maybe family members who are on eggshells, like you said. And so they just keep seeing that person reflected back, that person in crisis or fear of th that person or who they become. And, um, yeah, so I just think it's worth thinking about where are those spaces where somebody is allowed to be a new person or themselves again, or you know, who they wanna be. And I'm thinking of research that I conducted with um, young people who just had such an experience who were in first episode programs. And when I asked, you know, well, what was useful or hopeful or good about this? All of them just spoke about their experiences with peers, like the first thing they'd go to. And um, yeah, I think it just fits really nicely with what you said. That's really not a question, but. <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate that. And I, you know, it's so hard here. I mean, when I, when I first walked out of this study, I was like, all right, what we need is a, a peer in the emergency room, like a young person who's been through this in the last year or two, um, who's feeling better and who's willing to go in there and be like, it's okay. Like, you're going to be okay. Don't freak out, <laughs> you know, and to work with, uh, and, and families too. I thought it would be helpful for the peer to also see the families because even when I, you know, it's so hard when you, when you have this happen and then you go online and you see how badly this can turn out and all this weird media stuff and, and you don't have positive examples, we don't have a strong sense um, that people can get better um, based on what we can consume, you know, publicly. So we need these sort of private intimate experiences where people can help each other. And I even asked some of the, uh, I think of them as kids, that's terrible, they're not kids, but some of the young people as they were doing better, um, I would say like, oh, would you be willing to go back and do that? And they would be like, absolutely, I would, I would love to do that. It would be so meaningful for me too to go back and, and help. And we thought about like, can we build a Facebook page of our participants to see if like they can support each other? And it just, then there was a lot of anxiety, like, oh, well, do they, you know, uh, is that safe? Uh, do, you know, some of them don't even live more than a few blocks apart. It was just kind of mind blowing that all these people were having the same experience and they could help each other so much, but there was no way sort of legally uh, to make that safe enough to make that happen. So I'm rambling now too, but all, all these ideas, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in in relation to this. First of all, thank you so much, Neely, for a really, really inspiring talk in a lot of ways with huge implications, both for anthropology, but really for clinical practice and clinical services is a little bit what we're, we're talking about now. We do have a, a program at our hospital initiated by um, uh, AMI Quebec, I guess, uh, by the equivalent of NAMI in the US that uh, tries to provide in the ER support for families in particular. 
uh, kind of peer support among families. And mm -hmm. I think moving more in that direction, making those things routinely available is extremely important, but it also raises issues of, well, what kind of narrative is being shared and to what extent is it informed by this idea of trying to maximize people's moral agency and, and relationality. And there, you know, as you pointed out, and as we all know, we're up against a lot of uh, issues some of which are built into the way psychiatry conceives of the, the, the issues that it's dealing with. If you understand this as, a, as an individual problem that's located inside the person, located inside their brain or something, mm -hmm. then you can give yourself a very narrow purview that you're doing your task in this very narrow technical way and you're not necessarily even assessing very well or intervening in the relational network that the person's embedded in. So I, to me, this is when I, when I was in training a very long time ago, we all had intensive training in family therapy and that was considered a normal part of psychiatric training. That's not the case anymore, unfortunately, that, that you know, people have to seek it out more actively to get any any uh, depth training in that. And unfortunately, what it means is then you don't have the theoretical framework of sort of thinking systemically and thinking how important those relationships are to any kind of well being, whether it's with family or with peers or some other aspect of community. So I just think there's a lot to be done about, you know, reinforcing how vital those things are for any kind of uh, portrait of of recovery, of good functioning, of quality of life, and that a lot more effort needs to be going into, uh, first of all, supporting things that are in the community that don't depend on professionals at all, but then at least professionals understanding their role as things that are at least um, synergistic with that rather than corrosive to, to those efforts for people to sort of build and maintain a, a social world. And I think the kind of ethnographic research you're doing is absolutely vital and needs to, you know, there, there's a, a body of this already going back to earlier work, you know, Sue Estroff and other people documenting just how bad things can get in terms of the breakdown of social worlds. But the whole notion that there are ways of reconstructing these and, and that involves certain ways of talking. I, the final point I would just make is that one way of thinking about diagnoses is, is trying to give people a, um, a moment of recognition and a kind of picture of what's going on. So it's not always harmful if you say, oh yes, we know, uh, you know what you're describing is something I'm familiar with as a helper and we know and it, it's like this and here's what you might expect. I mean, people really want that and, and who better to get it from than somebody who actually does have some, some experience and expertise rather than, you know, um, uh, trolling the internet and finding, you know, whatever's the most sensational and most most disturbing. So uh, I think if we think of diagnosis that way, not simply as picking a label and then choosing a medication that goes with it, but of offering people uh, a kind of framework or a container for their experience um, that has positive effects in some ways, that doesn't just sort of, you know, here, here's the bad news, now go and work it out on your own kind of. Anyway, that's part of what I take from what you're talking about that to me is very resonant with, with core issues in everyday practice. Thank you so much. I, I really value your insight. And I think, it, yeah, I think it's really important, you know, just to respond. I, I, I think um, when I'm envisioning my emergency room team, I would love for that first 24 hours to include a family navigator and a young person and a social worker, and then for people to always be with that person, like never never leave that person. And I, I think that um, there are some programs, you know, tips and things like that in in Europe that are kind of trying to do, to do that a little bit. I think Open Dialogue, when it originally started, did that. Um, I don't know if they, it's, it would be a tremendous amount of resources, but I think it would be ideal as long as it was a good match of people, of course. But I do think, um, I just couldn't believe how little resources there were for, for families, um, even with NAMI. Uh, doing the best they could, you know, <laughs> like there's just a tremendous need. Um, the, so yeah, the family piece is huge. Um, and the, these giving people the sense that they can rebuild worlds, I think is, is really huge too. So I appreciate that. And I, I agree completely that for some, uh, that some Having the ability to go to sit with people and say, oh, look, I've seen people who've had this experience last week and the week before, you're not alone. Um, and to be able to say that with the authority of a, a doctor is really, really powerful, as, as you're pointing out. Um, and if, if I don't, I don't necessarily think the key site for reform is the psychiatrist. You know, I, I think there's so, so many things that need to happen on the community level. Um, but if, if psychiatrists could just think really carefully about whether or not they want to use the word psychosis, <laughs> um, because, because people will go home and, 
and Google it. And it, like, do they have to right now? Like, I don't know. Yeah, there, there is a move toward sort of trying to approach things at a more symptom level. So you can mm -hmm. say, well, you're having hallucinations, you're hearing voices, that happens in a lot of circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. We'll do some things to help you with that. You know, and that I think is a wise way for, for scientific reasons as well as sort of mm -hmm. the practical reasons, a wise way to be, at least at the beginning, to approach things, unless and until it's very clear, okay, this now really coheres in a, you know, a certain kind of entity that has a certain kind of prognosis, and maybe that's useful information to people as, as difficult as it may be. Um, but the other, I guess the other part to underscore again for me that I take from this is there's such a strong individualistic orientation in mental health care that we often work very poorly with families, even in a setting, you know, where families are, are there's family therapy training, there's some recognition, and it's framed often as an ethical issue. Oh, we can't talk to the family because we're here for you, and we can't share information with them, and they need a, their own therapist, or it's a separate thing, and we create, um, you know, real, real hardship at times, and really, really prevent the possibility, first of all, hardship for the families in terms of their, their fear, and their anxiety, and their grief, or whatever they're dealing with, but also in terms of really helping to maintain whatever can be maintained, or help people to negotiate the kind of transition that they need to make, so. So anyway, I'm going on about it because it, it touches on a lot of everyday kind of clinical concerns and frustrations in terms of seeing far from optimal care that people are getting, even from well-intentioned practitioners. So, so, yeah. yeah, and there's so much more that we could be doing. Um, so um, Michael, would, would you like to say something? You had your hand up. <laughs> I just realized that, sorry. Hi, thanks so much, Julie. This is really out of fun. Um, and um, I have a pretty simple question, I think. Um, I really liked the notion of self-mythologizing, the way that um, one dimension of grappling with and negotiating this new type of identity um, that could be really, really helpful for, for people exploring, particularly with peers, um, would be the, the, the sort of shifting of a personal narrative towards something celebratory or almost um, superhuman or heroic. And I was thinking a lot about the, the research that I did for my dissertation was sort of following in your footsteps in many ways. And um, I was wondering about another dimension of your comments about the absence of a right of, of a series of rites of passage within a broader culture. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if it's possible in some of the communities that you observed for um, entry into the hospital and then ultimately a departure mm -hmm. to serve as something like a rite of passage among peer groups specifically. Um, I'm having difficulty imagining it both in the space in my own research and outside of peer groups um, as, as being anything like a rite of passage without veering too close to some of the, um, I guess the traps of uh, recovery that you explored in your first book. Um, I don't know what you. I don't know what you encountered in terms of uh, the way that that moment of crisis gets repurposed in, among peer groups, and, and maybe you could say more. Okay. Um, well, you you broke up a tiny bit, but I think that. Oh, sorry. You're okay. <laughs> um, I I'm actually really interested in um, rites of passage broadly. I think that our our culture, like I said, is lacking elders, and we're lacking structured ways for people to take on meaningful identity. Um, to really explore in deep ways their um, their purpose and their calling and their people and you know their their name. <laughs> so I've, I've I've been doing a little bit of uh, wilderness rites of passage work on the side, and I think it would be really interesting thing to do with young people in crisis. And actually, the group that I've been working with, the School of Lost Borders, started um, when uh, Stephen Foster, who I believe was a Berkeley professor, started taking. Um, at-risk youth out of San Francisco into the desert to have a rite of passage as part of finding meaning in their own lives to kind of try to help them be less at risk at, from the juvenile justice system. Um, so that's a really interesting uh, group. And then I, I think Robert Barrett, of course, the anthropologist has written about how entry into psychiatric care is, is a failed, you know, rite of passage or a failed, you get stuck in this liminal state, you can't, you can't get out of it. And I think that was, I mean, that's something I'm using in my book because I think it's really salient. Uh, being diagnosed uh, does, does put you in a liminal space and it, the way out isn't clear. And I think what you're saying about peers possibly um, helping facilitate the transition out is great. One thing that I'm really concerned about is that 
at least in Texas, there aren't a lot of peers. So how do you create a cadre of competent, <laughs> awesome peers who are ready to take, and then also just shouldering the burden with being underpaid and sort of under, I mean, it's kind of, it almost reminds me right now of um, sort of, you know, whose responsibility is it to, to, um, I, I don't, I don't know how I want to put that. Um, I'm just concerned about what, you know, how many peers are there and is this what they want to do and um, what, with what, at what cost to them. Um, and then also, I think it's really important for the peer to be another young person in a lot of ways. And that's even harder, right? I mean, so you could have a well-intentioned person who wouldn't mind chatting with someone, but do they want to like usher someone through a rite of passage? <laughs> you know, that's like a whole nother level of care. And um, so those are kind of my initial thoughts. Does that sort of answer your? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Um, someone asked um, in the chat if I'm familiar with photo voice and, and I am. Another idea that I had when I first finished this that I tried to get funded was to make, um, to have young people make digital stories with, with someone who was going to be on their aftercare team and to have that be the first few follow-up appointments would be making a digital story about their experience uh, with, you know, their uh, crisis and their, you know, how they'd experienced treatment so far to kind of create a mutual understanding between them and maybe an arts-based therapist that, that also made uh, a product that they could share with their families or with friends or whatever to, to, um, to try and help bring people on board, kind of educate them about the experience, what they've been through, and sort of facilitate the self-mythologizing process. But and boy, it was, it's been hard, really hard to get that funded. Um, and again, it's hard to find people who can do that, right? Who, who are able to make these kinds of stories and want to work, work on it with with young people, um, just sta you know, staffing, uh, and ideally that would be done with peers. And then I read this great dissertation about how some efforts to make uh, photo voice like stories with people in Australia were um, actually had, had been turned into a mental health intervention that had then become sort of structured so that you, they, you know, the young person really didn't have control over their story. It had to fit into this model where they weren't allowed to say this or that and they couldn't be suicidal and they couldn't trigger other people and it was really astonishing how quickly this control of the autobiographical power swooped in when you kind of cl clinicized uh, something that's supposed to be creative a creative process so I don't know if these things can happen in services but I think photo voice is really cool um, and I love digital stories too so thank you Laura and I'm sorry you're not able to to be on video with us but I appreciate you participating um Erin Soros did you want to say something yeah, hello. Um, um, yeah, I'm a postdoc at U of Toronto, and I'm really grateful to be listening to this. That was a phenomenal presentation, and I think it's really um, adding to the, the dialogue about um, the meaning of crisis and meaning of recovery. And I, I just I thought it was really beautifully done. Um, I was interested in um, that a couple of the, I was wondering about precipitating events where there is a kind of crisis in the moral value of the person so that you talked about one woman where there was an economic crisis so she's living with her family that's not a, like that's not a great feeling for a young person to not have their own independence and so I was wondering about I, I was doing um, oral I'm a, I'm a oral historian so I was doing work in the UK and what I was interested in is like the precipitating elements that brought somebody to crisis as a moral figure like so they lost their value and then the delusions, what I found was interesting, I'm a writer, so they would, they would say, oh, I'm a writer too. And I, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I do, they would want to have a legitimacy. The, the delusions, even though they were delusional, there were sense there. And the sense was about having a moral voice in the world. Like they wanted to be, a um, oh, I'm in a film, I'm a writer, I'm doing this. And they were imaginary constructions, but they spoke of a yearning. Mm -hmm. And what I found was interesting is that often with the diagnosis of that you lack insight. That's the kind of people always throw that around. That people can have a delusion, but still have profound insight, even through the delusion, because the delusion speaks a kind of truth of a yearning, or and they can have insight a lot about the stories that happen to them around the delusion. There's a lot of insight, but there isn't a curiosity about that. Um, and that I was wondering about 
how we nurture that thinking, both within a clinical setting and in the public setting. Because I just heard a radio host talking about, well, people lack insight. Well, they need to be institutionalized, they lack insight. It's like, it's by definition. He kept using the word by definition. Mm. Um, and yet what I found was a, a really, there was a lot of profound insight when people spoke to do with grief, mm. to do with loss of legitimacy of their own family, economic grief, their own illegitimacy, not being married, not having a job, all the ways of not being significant in a culture. Um, and then what I also found so moving about your talk is that you spoke about the, the incredible violation of the police and then being bound to a bed, which is, we know that's a violation and yet that's part of the treatment and then there's no ritual or way of framing that, that you've actually experienced something that takes away your agency mm -hmm. and then is a violation it, it's seen as part of the cure and it just kind of like here you go with your meds but mm -hmm. i was wondering about what political entry there is or organizational entry to challenge that the immediacy I, I heard a lecture just recently of a woman who was she was restrained drugged and in solitary confinement mm -hmm. and she weighs 120 pounds why do you need three forms all at once without any attempt and she said there was no attempt she trusted her husband even in the delusion, she still trusted her husband. There was no attempt to bring the family in and have dialogue with her. It was this immediate carceral response. And I thought you spoke to the effect and the, the, the people, you, your subjects spoke to the effect of that treatment. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the legal side of what's going on um, is so fascinating, right? I mean, everything about a hospitalization experience says we value the public more than you um, and you're dangerous. And um, we know that things like solitary confinement are psychotogenic. There's no question about that. <laughs> um, and yet we still we still use it. Uh, we don't need to have four point restraints. We don't, I, I mean, I don't know how I feel about involuntary injections. Um, I'm not, you know, a frontline worker and, but it, it does seem like if, why can't we have more respites? But again, that peer workforce that we need so desperately is underpaid and not trained and not cultivated and, and who, you know, not everybody walking around wants to be a therapist or, or help people with a mental health crisis. Um, so that's a real challenge too, but I really appreciate what you, what you were saying earlier about this deep yearning. Um, well, two things. One, when you talked about that deep yearning to be an artist to express yourself, to express your truth. I think that's so true for so many people. Um, and there's, there, I mean, I did know, this is one thing that I'm going to write about in the book. I just haven't gotten there yet. But um, this idea of playing with pain or playing through pain and how play and music and art really helps people connect um, in, a, in a totally different way than um, the creative, there's something about creative expression that seems to be profoundly therapeutic that we don't, that we don't value. Uh, so much and, and there's a deep yearning for recognition as an artist that a lot of people that I worked with had especially as a music a music artist um, and then this idea um, now I've forgotten the second thing that I was going to tell you <laughs> but maybe it's a third thing um, so maybe I'll I'll stop there but yeah your your response is is uh, res resonates quite a bit So I, I wanted to come back briefly to the earlier discussion about uh, peer support and about um, initiation, because it seems to me that those maybe are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you look at, you know, traditional rights of initiation in different societies, uh, in the traditional form, this is to say, it's usually elders and older people, people mm -hmm. who hold the social status that the young person, the initiate is going to acquire who do that. And it's true that in our society, partly because we lack some of those forms, uh, and that it gets taken over uh, by young people. And this is you know, one of the theories of sort of youth gangs and so on, is that one of the dynamics is a, a need developmentally in adolescence to have some kind of 
scaffolding for your, you know, your great energy and your potential and people invent it themselves in some way and set themselves trials and everything else. But clearly by using that example, the implication is not always for the best uh, for people in the sense of how pro-social it is or what kinds of, where it leads uh, in, in the long run for them and so on. So just to say that I think there's an intergenerational thing or an extended thing that has to go on as well uh, in terms of uh, enabling people to, to connect to a larger social world. Uh, and, and maybe that's helpful also because as you point out, nobody wants to, or only a minority of people are gonna make a career out of their illness in the sense of saying, okay, I've had this thing, now I'm gonna become a helper and that's what I do and that makes sense out of my suffering. We don't wanna force anybody. I mean, some, of, some people that's their calling and that's the right response, but we don't want anybody to feel compelled to do that like they have to do that because if they can if they if their path is to distance from it they ought to be able to anyway just to pose that as a question then do you think that in some ways what you can get from a peer uh, support is somewhat different than from what you might get from um, a trusted elder of some kind or you know other kinds of roles I'm just taking those two there are other ones we could think of yeah no that's a that's a great question um, I I mean there's just something profoundly important. Uh, and undervalued, and at least in American culture, about elders and people who've who've seen it all and are are wise and gentle and kind. I really love this model um, that they that I think started in Ghana called the friendship bench, where um, old seniors uh, who you know older ladies without a lot of chores to do are are manning the benches a bench that's kind of in a public area, and you can come and sit down and talk to her. And I think we have a huge undertapped population of seniors who would love to support. Um, a young person and offer advice. And if, if anyone has had the joy of spending time with any seniors, it is really awesome to just connect with someone who's been alive for a long time and has seen it all. Um, so I think there's a place for that and um, that, that's completely missing. And, and maybe a, a seasoned peer would be akin, akin to that, but you're, I mean, I just really hadn't thought of it this way. I mean, I, I wouldn't have suggested the peer maybe be in charge of the right of, of passage for the reason that you suggested. But then when Michael said it, it sounded like not such a bad idea. And now I'm thinking, huh, that's interesting because we almost are expecting peers to do that, right? To be everything. There, there's, there's another aspect to it that's uh, for me been sometimes problematic in discussions with uh, peer support or people more in other settings where there's a sort of person with lived experience who's like the, the representative of, of people with lived experience, which is kind of an absurd position to be in given the diversity of experiences. But that is both, that's an external sort of problem in terms of what's expected from that person. But there's also a more internal problem, if you will, of if you've lived through very dramatic things and you survived, you're invested in, in your own journey and, and you may tend to impose it on other people as a model for what they're going through, what they ought to go through, or what, what they're mm -hmm. likely to go through. And that may not be accurate. I mean, everybody's experience, you know, to varying degrees may be unique. And so this is, I see this a lot in indigenous contexts and in, in, in group when you have uh, group settings where people are sharing stories and there's always this impulse to produce something that's a kind of a new norm uh, within the group for, you know, this is what a good story looks like and this is this is how you should approach it. So again, I see ideally the role of professionals and the role of people who have experience with lots of different kinds of problems is to open up some space for variation and experience, not to close it down. Uh, and then that could work in, in concert in some way with people who are then providing the, the you know, the so solidarity and support that you're talking about. Yeah, you guys have all my wheels turning now. <laughs> Hi, Neely. Just before you go, this is Angela. Excellent lecture. And nice so to nice you. to see you. you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wondered if you could quickly elaborate. I know this might be a bit late, but because Lawrence was talking about um, intergenerational aspects of what, um, you know, some of these interventions, um, I actually wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the role of early intervention programs, um, whether in the US or in the state in which you are based right now, because I reckon there might be a lot of diversity. Uh, so the role of these programs in, in addressing the, uh, the issues that we've just been discussing right now. Yeah, so I mean, I think it depends. So we have, you know, uh, Lisa Dixon's done wonderful work. They have an excellent, you know, model program that works really nicely when it's done in its full uh, glory, right? But um, a lot of times programs are underfunded. So 
they'll so what I've noticed is that states and and cities and they have to make decisions about what they can staff, what they can fund, what the what healthcare will cover, right? So I don't know. How, do you have to do this in Canada? So you really have to pick and choose. So what really tends to happen is that um, medication management and you know just it almost looks like treatment as usual with maybe an assertive community treatment aspect to it. And then they th think, oh, well, we would fund vocational and educational support and family psychoeducation and cognitive uh, remediation therapy. If we had, we'll do that later. Right now, we just need to at least have this basic component. And so what I saw happening anyway was that um, when young people came in for things like group therapy, that it wasn't even specialized to young people. They were just using things that, that were already there. Um, because they didn't have the funding to create specialized services. I'm pretty sure in Canada, you have some pretty nice, I mean, at least when I was in Toronto, I was hearing about some great services for young people where if you're under 25, you go straight there, there's no questions asked and it's all yeah. set yeah. up. I think there's excellent services as you were just saying, but the problem does end up, you know, it does pan out in the end. Um, it ends up relating to issues of funding, as you were just saying, but not only that, I think fragmentation of services um, very much at all levels and, and the issue of the, the federal um, not, uh, you know, kind of delegating the, the powers of health care and portions of social care and then how it gets um, sort of fragmented as well as distributed across different jurisdictions, whether it's, you know, local, municipal, um, provincial, uh, so there's a lot of fragmentation at the level of the system. Not to mention, it's, you know, rural, like so many rural are in major yeah. cities, like metropolitan areas. So I'm, I'm not even talking First Nations, right? So there, there's a whole lot uh, to consider there. And then also with the issue of transitions, which I suspect is massive uh, mm -hmm. in the field of psychosis, right? How do you shift from uh, youth services to, to adult services? And when you're stuck in that, um, I think you mentioned it earlier, that intersection between development mental um, health and disabilities and psychiatric disabilities and mental health, um, there's a bit of a, of a hiatus, not, not to say um, a silo, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, for example, and, and then if you're in any way disadvantaged, right, so in the U.S., in my city, if you're, um, my understanding is that you have to, if you're in foster care, you have to choose between mental health care and physical health care. You can't have both, so you can just imagine how do you make that choice? <laughs> um, so I think that, so what blows my mind, and, I, and maybe this is a good place to end, but is that we know what to do and we have good ideas about how to do it. And we know that it has tremendous negative consequences, or it can not to, that, that, that these things can be powerfully disabling or they can be empowering and help people transition to a really meaningful, fulfilling life uh, with, you know, as, as a, a, a crisis as a means to, self, you know, to self beautifying or, or whatever, however you want to see that, but crisis as blossoming or crisis as uh, plummeting. And we know how we, we don't know how to do it maybe for everyone, but we, we have a pretty good idea now of how to do great things for a lot of people. And man, I don't understand why the willpower isn't there because it's so expensive to do it the other way. But the way I see it is we have this, this group of people that haven't been well cared for at the beginning that are very expensive. Um, the kind of people that I was working with in my first book. And then we have people who are just entering in and we would need to spend a lot of money there too. So like for a while we would have these two huge expenses to cover. Um, but I would, I would think that if we just really did this well on the front end uh, in a concentrated way that we would have a tiny group of people in 20 or 30 years who are uh, in long-term disability situations. So. Thank you uh, very much. I think this is a nice uh, conclusion and now we are uh, out of time. So um, uh, let's all um, thank uh, Professor Meyer through uh, <laughs> virtual, virtual modes. And thank you very much. It was a wonderful talk. And um, uh, prepare yourself for a next uh, Politics of Psychic Life talk uh, next month. Thank you so much. It was really thank nice you. to see you all. <laughs> And just to let all of you know, there will be other talks in this same time slot in other series coming up, which we'll announce. So make sure you're on the mailing list for it. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing all of you here. Thanks a lot, Neely. Look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Lawrence. Bye. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.